for signing in. Um, it should not leave you, will not leave the webinar if you click on that. Um, but that helps us get names and email addresses if we have to send anything out later uh, and helps keep us accountable on attendance for our grant. And then Sherry, are you able to get set up and record? You are recording. All righty then, perfect. Hi, Karen. Hopefully Karen can get me on my stop for video for us. All right, so welcome everybody. Today we're talking about, um, that. I titled this language development and deaf blindness, but there's actually an error in that. Uh, I really should have titled this communication and language development and deaf blindness, um, because as we know, language is just a tool used for communication, but communication itself is so much broader. So we're really kind of gonna be touching on both today. Um, and if any of my Maryland teachers that are on here, especially need any sort of justification for why we're doing this and why you are using these foundational skills when you are working with your students and teaching them. I found if I can get my computer to play nice. I was on Maryland Learning Links earlier today and under the alternate instructional framework from Maryland Learning Links, it talks about communicative competence as one of those main skills. And it states in there that communication is an essential life skill and an essential building block for the development of language. It is required to access curriculum and instruction and is a basic human need and right. With access to a means of effective communication, all students can interact and exchange information with others, develop relationships, and participate fully in society. So that's why we are here today is to give you the tools to be able to do that successfully. So also part of the why, really why we do this is for our kids who are deaf blind, the impact that language learning has on their social and communi social communication skills. Um, First thing is missing nonverbal communication. So 90% of information is received through our distant senses, which are, is our vision and hearing. Um, so children with vision and hearing loss miss that incidental social and educational information. Um, some of our kids have motor challenges. They may struggle with sign production if they have fine motor challenges, spoken language if there is oral motor challenges, um, or accessing a complex AAC device if they required to isolate their finger, say to hit a button or scroll through folders on an AAC device. There sometimes is limited communication partners because it sometimes takes time, a lot of time and patience um, for our kids to process, both take in and process a message as well as process a response. Um, and young, typically developing children don't often take the time to have the time to sit and wait for uh, another student or a peer to respond. So they need someone who is going to take that time to provide them with an accessible message and wait for their response. And they need someone who understands their signals because they may not communicate in a typical fashion. Uh, there's a sense of isolation sometimes. We know that kids with CVI, which is cortical visual impairment, um, and is the leading cause of visual impairment in children in the United States. And for those kids, they might have an inability to navigate a complex sensory environment like a playground or a cafeteria. Um, so they can end, often end up in the corner and, and missing out on those social opportunities and feel very alone. Inconsistent communication modalities is another one. So for some of our kids, they might use one modality receptively and another expressively. Um, one modality might be used at used and modeled and responded to at home. And another modality might be modeled and encouraged in school. Fatigue is a huge one for our kids too. Um, just from trying to listen all day, to decoding and processing a message, 
um, trying to use vision sometimes for language as well as other tasks, battling motor needs, could be internal factors. And really in regard to communication modalities too, my little soapbox for a moment is, is that our children need access to a rich, accessible, receptive language foundation model. Um, this can be sometimes a challenge to determine for our kids that they might have some access to sound or some access to vision, but not always getting a complete message in one modality or the other. So really, um, it, it can be a challenge to determine what is going to be most accessible to them, but we really need to be providing them with a rich, accessible, receptive language model in order for them to be able to develop a functional, expressive language modality as well. Um, we know the brain fills in with what it knows. So if it's missing, if you have the windows down and the radio on, if it's a song that you know the words to, you likely can tell exactly what that song is and sing along to it. But if it was something that you'd never heard before and you were trying to decipher and decode the words of that song, you likely wouldn't be able to with all that additional background noise. That's the same for our kids who have a hearing loss um, in an attempt to, when they're attempting to learn language and learn all of those phonetic sounds of language that make up words, if they're not getting the complete message, then they're not going to be able to utilize those receptively or expressively later on. Jen, would you like questions now or do you want to hold them till the end? Sure, whenever. At what point do you decide to shift focus from language exposure and access to language? So we're, we're never shifting off of language exposure. So we're all consistently exposing our kids to language, full and complete language. Um, that's, that's never thing. We're always going to provide them with that consistent exposure to a higher, higher level um, language model. But we are focusing, when we talk about focusing on communication and how our students communicate back to us, that's where we're going to look into maybe some different modalities um, and some other supportive ways to let them do that if they are not at the language level yet. Does that make sense or is that? Keep going. <laughs> so what foundational skills are needed in order for our kids to be able to communicate with us and develop expressive language? Um, they need a trusted relationship with a caregiver and teachers or providers, whoever is going to be with them. Those people need to be open and available for, uh, you know, our kids need to be open and available for learning. They need to develop trust. They need to have trust in the safety of their environment. Um, trust in that people that are working with them are not going to be, they're not just going to be startled unexpectedly um, by something that they can't see or hear coming at them. They need to have trust that people are going to respond to how they let them know that they're saying no or that they don't like something. So having that trust and that safety allows them to be open and available for that opportunity to learn and to be, want to be to communicate with others. Uh, our kids need real life experiences. And so think of the difference between the, in the experience you would have if you went to say an amusement park in a stroller all day long versus if you went to that amusement park and you actually got to ride the rides and get in the, the wave pool and actually experience fully what that had to offer. Um, a lot of times real life experiences we can bring some things to our kids. For example with technology now if you go for a trip to the zoo uh, I had a deafblind teacher telling me lately that the good way to is you can take the iPad and teacher could take the iPad with them. And when you're looking at certain animals, they can take a picture of that animal and then enlarge it on the iPad. So for a child that has a lower acuity, they can actually see, have a better visual image of that animal when it is blown up for them and brought closer. Um, but that's not true for all of our deafblind students, depending on their visual needs. So the opportunity to have real life experience, real hands-on experiences, that are holistic and complete. Real objects for exploration. Again, real things that they can touch, feel, that look like the thing, that feel like the object. Um, 
we're kind of going to discuss more later on that when we talk about some concepts if we get into if we have time for concept development um, but just utilizing real objects for our kids to explore again holistically um, we need to bring our the world to them our kids do not know what's out there to search for if they can't see it or they don't hear it they don't know what's available out that there for them to tactually search for. So we need to bring those items to them and teach them how to seek out more things within their world. And we encourage independent exploration through touch using hand under hand. And we're going to talk more about hand under hand in a little bit, but we, we encourage our kids to seek out and explore things by guiding them and showing them what is out there for them to explore and touch and experience and continuously fostering independence. Um, typical kids fall and get up all the time. They struggle. You know, our deafblind kids often might struggle a little bit more, but they need that opportunity to do so in order to develop that independence and become fully functioning adults when they have the capability to do so. So Jen, mm -hmm. so language exposure is crucial in their environment is what I'm hearing. Yes. Be that a spoken language, TASL or ASL. Correct. Language exposure is crucial. Um, it's just talking about when we talk about language exposure, we need to look at what is accessible to that child. Um, if the child has a significant profound hearing loss and we're just exposing them to spoken English all day long, um, then that might not be an accessible exposure to language for them. Uh, and this can vary for all of our kids. When we look at fatigue in our kids who are deafblind, they sometimes need access to multiple modalities throughout the day because they might be able to take in a, they might have strong visual skills in the morning when they're fresh and they get into school and they can take in visual ASL for half the day. But then as their vision fatigues in the afternoon, they might need tactile ASL. They might need an opportunity to move to a tactile model because they can't continuously use their vision for accessing language as well as learning and looking at materials. Um, the same goes for our kids who are hard of hearing, who are working through cochlear implants to try and decode a message all day long, working on that listening skill just to take in the language and determine what is being said, and then adding that additional layer piece to it to trying to actually learn new concepts through that modality. So. It's all about determining what is most accessible for our kids and how we can scaffold and sandwich language if we are trying to learn multiple, modal multiple modalities at one time. So this is um, a random thing that I had in here that uh, I can put this link in the chat box at the end for you guys. Um, but it was just something that was found that it is a, it's a letter to teachers from a parent and this is really for early childhood teachers because it's about talking about, it's a perspective from a parent of someone coming into their home and really talks about just being judged. Um, and so it kind of is evident, it's, it's applicable right now because really right now we're all teaching in people's homes. We're in their homes, be it by Zoom or however we're accessing. So we're seeing their home life, their environment, what their family's going through, who's all in their home. Um, so it just talks about really having that open mind and not judging others, not judging, you know, the look of somebody's home, their ability to engage with you, how they engage with you or their child in when you're trying to teach them how to teach their child at home, uh, their ability to follow through. It's really our job as a teacher to acknowledge where somebody is and support them where they're at to, to be effective. If I just, you know, go, oh, that person is a bad parent and they're not doing anything, I, I, can't, I can't do anything to work with that. that. That's on me. That's on me as a bad teacher because it is my job to see the needs of an individual and modify my approach to help them be successful. And that's what we do as teachers with our kids. So that's what we have to do right now as teachers to parents who are trying to teach their own kids. Um, so just something to be conscious and aware of um, when we are trying to, to teach through distance learning. And it's, it's frustrating for teachers, it's frustrating for parents, and uh, we're gonna be doing it for a little while longer. So <laughs> we gotta barrel through. This is just a, the federal def definition of deaf blindness that you'll find in IDEA. Um, and just information that you guys should have 
because deaf blind does not necessarily mean that the child must be completely blind or completely deaf. And so oftentimes in IEP meetings, we'll get the question of, well, why can't we just put deaf or hearing impaired and visually impaired as the, the coding, disability coding for a child in their IEP? And really, I mean, physically schools can, but the reason why we really encourage the use of the, the deaf blind code is because they're not being addressed as separate conditions. Um, educators, all the providers really need to be aware of the impact of that dual sensory impairment on communication and concept development. So just good info to have. Hand under hand. So really when we are working with deaf blind kids and really any student that has complex learning needs, we wanna be using hand under hand as the strategy to help teach them new skills, explore new things, reach out and seek things out in their world and not hand over hand. Hand over hand is used a lot. Um, it's a teaching strategy that is used a lot in schools, but we don't wanna use hand over hand because whose brain is working when we're using hand over hand? It's the adult's brain that's working, not the child's. The adult is in control of the entire interaction. Um, when we're looking at educational goals, hand over hand is gonna mean 100% complete success because it's the adult that's doing it and, and not the child. The child just has to passively accept having their hand controlled and then being put through the motions in order to get credit for whatever they're doing. Um, I have also seen goals written to teach kids to tolerate hand over hand. Uh, and, you know, let's say, for example, if the sensory bin, the material in a sensory bin that I'm being asked to touch, to me, feels like fire ants. If you want me to, why am I ever going to want to tolerate be, having my hand put in that? And then, if that's my first experience with some sensory with a sensory bin or a sensory material because of whatever sensory integration issues that i have i'm also not going to want to touch anything else that you provide me with because how do i know if i can't see it clearly that it's not the same material that feels like fire ants to me um, so then the child gets deemed as non-compliant and not able to complete the task um, using hand over hand because they're not tolerating something that doesn't allow them the control to let you know that something is either that they don't want it or they don't like it or it's uncomfortable and they lose all control and communication attempts. So we use hand under hand. Other reasons why we use hand under hand is it allows us access to the ways people use their hands. So for children who are not incidentally seeing how adults use their hands to manipulate things, pull them apart, pick them up, put to something together, squeezing Play-Doh, all of those skills that we do and things that we do with our hands and ways that we manipulate things, um, kids can learn through hand under hand. That's how we provide them with that access. It provides them spatial awareness through tactile experience. So feeling the width or the depth of a sensory bin, understanding how large their tray is that they have, how much space that they have in front of them with their in their work area, what's on that space that they can seek out and reach out for, where objects are on the table in front of them. It encourages authentic involvement. Um, so the purpose and the whole goal of Hand Under Hand is that you start with the child, with the adult's hand under the child's, the child's hand on top, with the adult exploring the, the item, the material, manipulating whatever is going on. And then eventually, if the child accepts it and isn't rejecting the experience, the adult hand can slowly slide out and remove themselves. So then that allows and encourages the child to, to be more, more independently explore the material, the object, but it's a way to kind of bridge that so that the child knows that it's safe, it's okay to touch, it's not going to be a negative experience, and then the adult can slowly back out from that and encourage that authentic involvement in the activity. It stimulates curiosity. Kids are more willing to try new things when they're in a trusted situation. Um, sighted 
children develop curiosity by seeing what others are doing or what somebody else has. Oh, that looks interesting to me. I want that. I might take it. Um, so this helps our kids stimulate curiosity through touch and through seeing that the adults enjoy playing with something, what they do with it, how it works, and stimulates that curiosity. It prepares kids for tactile, sli tactile signing. Some of our students um, may have to develop this, this acceptance of hand under hand. Um, lots of kids are, are somewhat a little tactually defensive sometimes with new textures, new experiences, even people touching them. So this is something that might have to be developed. It might not happen right off the bat, which is often why people will go to hand over hand because, oh, if the child doesn't accept hand under hand, then what do I do? Um, it, it might have to be developed, but that comes through starting from a less invasive space. Maybe that's their elbow, maybe that's their shoulder, and then moving down so that the child knows that it's coming and that we're at moving towards their hand and just developing that comfort through play, through tactile stimulation, just through engagement with other adults of having, being comfortable with having their hands touched and interacted with and manipulated, maybe through putting lotion on or finger plays or different activities, um, and then preparing them for hand, over, hand under hand to explore objects and then to prepare for access to tactile signing. And the last one is joint attention. Um, which is great because this is a way to show our kids it's doing something together. For sighted kids, you know, an adult might go, oh, look at that bird up there in the sky. And the, so the child and the adult are looking at the same thing and engaging in the same thing and same activity at the same time. And that's joint attention. So how do we develop that in our children who are deafblind? We need to do that tactually. And so that can come through hand under hand exploration. And I have a, oh. First, we have a picture, a um, couple here of hand under hand. And so Carlos on the left is still pretty resistant to touching things. So he needs a little bit more support. So he is comfortable though with having his hand on top of mine. And you can see I am petting that dog. Um, and then actually after a couple of attempts, he became more comfortable with it. And he actually, I was actually then able to slide my hand out and he was rubbing the dog himself. And then you'll see on the right there, Mr. Pierce is actually pretty comfortable with touching things. And so his mom is just providing him some support at his elbow to keep his, to be able to keep his hand up and guide his hand towards where the dog is for him to pet it. Um, so support comes in various ways with in allowing our kids increasing independence. So Jenna, a question? Uh-huh. What are ways to help a child explore who would rather not participate but has the ability to explore? learned helplessness and or lack of interest in becoming involved. So that's our goal to try and, and develop that interest and encourage them to participate in more things. And that's hopefully through the hand under hand. Are they, why are they not interested? Is it not something that interests them? Do we need to change the activity? Is it that they have, um, you know, we haven't stimulated what their motivation is, what their likes are, are we focusing on their dislikes and providing them things that they're not interested in touching um, and encouraging that curiosity through hand under hand. And so, like I said, we might have to build that. That's not going to necessarily come right off the bat where they're just going to be like, yeah, I will happily keep my hand on top of yours and play with this thing that I, that doesn't really interest me because I might not know how to functionally play with it. Um, some of our kids don't know how to functionally play with toys or manipulate objects. So that's our goal to kind of teach them through this joint tactile exploration. Um, but you might have to build that. And that comes from modeling for them, making it a fun experience. And we might have to, you know, when our kids, if our kids resist providing them either that wait time for them to come back to us because some of our kids need to resist and process information and will come back to us to do that hand over hand under hand, um, or we kind of find ways to go to them, see how far we can bring it to their hand. Maybe we're bringing it to a different part of their body. Maybe we start with their feet. Um, maybe we start bringing the, the sensory material or the object and rubbing it on their arm or something that's less invasive to them and then slowly bringing it to them and getting it under their hand. It's something that sometimes has to be built 
that doesn't happen automatically, um, but it will hopefully eventually lead to more engagement and involvement from kids with things, them, them finding more interest in a variety of stuff. And just a comment, mm -hmm. there's a the timeline, it's when they're ready. Right, it is, it is when they're ready. And it is our goal to facilitate that and try to encourage that and support that, but at the same time, not force that. Because if we cross that line and we catch them before they're ready, then we are gonna, they're gonna shut down and they're never gonna be ready to engage with us. If we lose that box, that open box that led, makes them available for learning and they shut down, then they're not gonna wanna participate in anything with us because they're gonna lose that trust. It's developing that trusted relationship. So this is a cute, quick little video of a little guy, Orion, with his mom. Um, it's in ASL, but it's captioned for you guys. And just to see how she uses hand under hand to help him help them explore a, um, a meal together. It should be captioned. Yep. There we go. Now. All right, and then he's done. Whoa. He's not stopping. All right. Oh, that was... And we can't make it. There we go. All right. So just a nice quick example. Um, I mean, definitely Orion is the, the a classic example because he is completely deaf and blind and his family is deaf. So they have been providing him with access to hand under hand and tactile sign language since the day he was born. Um, but just a nice example to see of how mom models for him that adults eat because this is something that Orion doesn't see. He's asked to eat to eat things and eat certain foods and he doesn't see that other people eat these foods too, that they're safe, how do people eat, what happens during a meal time, um, and it's a way for them to be social and engage together using hand in hand. So another thing we give to our kids is wait time. Children with deaf blindness need more time to process information, the whole thing. They need time to decode the message, take in what's being told to them or signed to them or presented to them tactually. They need time to process that information and they often need time to plan a response, maybe motorically to get their motor planning going to either give something out physically or spoken, however they are expressing their message. So that takes a lot of extra time. Um, it depends on the child's physical challenges, their communication level. So always in everything that you're doing, just slow down and give them that wait time because you might see a lot more responses 
from your students that you didn't realize that they were capable of because we kind of just push them through and may not give them a chance to respond in their manner and how they are able to, to respond. This is another long thing that you guys don't need to read, but it's called the Balancing Act and it's just reminds everybody to, it talks about the, the complex challenge of for kids who have motor needs of trying to work on motor skills and cognitive skills at the same time. Uh, and this is just very, it, it's very evident for all of our kids that we have to be aware of the demands of the, the physical motor and the cognition at the same time, but also the physical motor and the communication. If they're not in a fully supported position, they might not be able to use their arms or their eyes or whatever they utilize to communicate. Um, it talks, you know, we need to think about the balance of vision and hearing at the same time. For some of our kids with CBI, they might not be able to take in visual information and auditory information at the same time. So if we are providing them with signs and spoken language at the same time, they might not be getting either of them. They might not be getting the message at all. They might be missing both forms. Um, so something to remember that total communication does not have to necessarily mean simultaneous communication. We can use the sandwiching method. So taking whatever is most accessible to them if, or if they are a deaf child that is working on accessing some spoken language, maybe we give them the sign and then the spoken word and then the sign again. Or maybe the opposite way around, we give them the spoken word and then the sign or the tactile sign and then the spoken word. So sandwiching and layering those pieces of information in different modalities, because if we give them, give them to them individually, they might get one or the other, but if we give them to them at the same time, they might get neither. Um, so just remembering that balancing act of we need to support one need in order to encourage another. Communication. So we're talking, still talking about communication. So we know there's two different, two forms of communication. Receptive, how somebody receives and understands our message. So we know it's not necessarily just good enough to say that I sent the message. Oh, I told them, I exposed them to it. Um, we need to make sure that our children have access to it and understand our, our message that we are sending to them. Um, and maybe if they don't, then we need to change how we present our message to them. Uh, and then expressive communication. How are they letting us know what they want, what they need, what their likes and dislikes are? What do we need to communicate? We need a way, we need a form. Is that touch cues, objects? vocalizations, pictures, gestures, sign speech. So you guys can see there is a huge range of ways um, that individuals communicate. It is not just signs or spoken language. Um, and we're gonna get a look into some of the different uh, ways that we can encourage that those types of communication. We need a reason to communicate something that was immediately relevant, that we can be reinforced if I ask for something that I can receive it, or if I want to do something that I can be, that my communication attempts are reinforced. If I'm a child in a wheelchair and the only thing that I wanna do is get out of my wheelchair and I use a gesture to signal that I wanna do this, and but I'm never allowed out of my wheelchair for whatever reason, then why am I ever going to wanna communicate something else or wanna talk about the vocabulary that you want me to talk about if my motivation, motivating attempts to communicate are not reinforced. Um, so we really need to look at what are our kids' likes and dislikes and focusing on those as foundational communication skills in addition to any of that core vocabulary that we are trying to present to them. Um, we need something, a topic to communicate about. So that's why we expose our kids to lots of vocabulary and labels, give them labels for things so that they can eventually hopefully use those to express back to us. And a communication partner, somebody who knows the child's language, which whom they can communicate, somebody who is an active listener and can respond to them. I had a little guy that I used to work with who realized when he could blow, but he could blow raspberries. He could use his mouth and he could blow raspberries. 
Um, and everybody, of course, thought it was cute and we would reinforce it. And so we would blow raspberries back to him. Um, and he had limited communicate, he had limited ability uh, control over the rest of his body. So he quickly found out this is not only a way to engage with somebody, but it's also a way to get attention from other people too, because it was something that he could control and that he could easily do. And so he would, when there were other peers around him, when there were other adults around him, he would just start blowing raspberries because this was his way to try and communicate and engage with somebody based on his ability level. Um, so our kids need somebody who understands their language and engages with them and responds to them. Um, on the same token, we, they need somebody who can model how they communicate or how we want them to communicate. Um, I've heard a lot that I've been told a lot, oh, well, we're not using signs with Johnny because Johnny doesn't sign. Well, Johnny might not sign because Johnny doesn't ever see anybody as an environment sign. Um, Johnny also isn't learning to speak Spanish because nobody is speaking Spanish to him. So our kids need consistent language models for, them, for the language that we want them to use, and they need somebody to teach them that vocabulary as well so that, that we want them to use as an expressive mode. So Jan, a question? Huh? How would you encourage single parents to help with engaging and teaching their child without a communication partner? How does the child understand their role when the parent is teaching and communicating? So you are, I mean, it doesn't necessarily, because especially a lot of our kids don't pick up on that incidental those that's incidental information anyway, they might not be picking up, whereas a typically developing, you know, sighted deaf child or hearing child might be listening to mom and dad's conversation or seeing their signing and picking up on that vocabulary, our deaf blind kids may not be getting that anyway. So you are the communication partner. A single, it doesn't matter if it's just one person or 50 people, you are that child's communication partner and you are teaching them, but at the same time being that that person just to engage with them. They, they are, you should be learning through natural experiences too and not just always direct teaching. You are their communication partner and just talking to them. Um, you know, we, as teachers, especially as teachers of young kids, we narrate our world all the time. Oh, look, I'm, you know, cleaning, I'm wiping down the table, I'm, you know, making dinner and talking about what we're doing and how we do it. Um, step by step. And so just in communicating with your child about anything and everything and during those times where you're playing with them or you're just sitting watching TV with them or you're snuggling or reading a book that you become their communication partner and you are teaching them through modeling in those natural experiences. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> um, so when we're looking at receptive communication and what are some ways that we can help get our message to our students who are deafblind, um, we can use a variety of methods, including touch cues. So touch cues are a way to let, to let a child know what's gonna happen to them. Um, there are specific signals that are executed on the child's body. It's great if it is a system. It's great if the child's you know, family and education team come up with a system and a set of, okay, every time we're gonna put on Johnny's AFOs, we touch his leg to let him know his AFOs are coming. Um, every time he's going to, you know, we're gonna pick him up, we touch him under his, under his arms and let him know before we pick him up. That's great if we can do that. Um, but it does not necessarily have to be a fully functioning formal system. Um, touch cues can simply be a way to respect our children as human beings and let them know, give them a warning that something is gonna happen to their body before it happens. Um, so that might simply be touching them by their eyes before we put their glasses on. Simply rubbing their ear before we put their hearing aids on. Um, I, I have seen people come up behind kids and just put glasses on their face and that child had no indication that that was coming at them 
um, or awareness of where it came from or who did that. So it, it's simply out of respect for our kids to let them know that something is gonna happen to their body before it happens so that they have a warning and they can anticipate it and they're not stressed at all times that they're not sure when or from where or who is going to invade their space. Um, one huge example of this, of course, is suctioning for a kid that has a trach. Um, that's often can be a very stressful and invasive experience for a child. And if they don't know when it's coming, if nobody lets them know when it's their turn to be suctioned before it happens, even if they can hear that suction machine when it turns on, they might not know, is that my turn for the suction machine or is that somebody else's turn for the suction machine in class? And so if we don't get them, we don't let them know when it's their turn and when it's coming at them, that stress level is gonna increase every time that machine is turned on in the classroom, whether it's for them or not. Um, so it's uh, allowing just an, a respect to our children before we invade their space and a way to alleviate some of that stress of what they don't know is coming because they can't see or hear it. Name cues are just a tactile way to identify someone uh, let them know who you are, and then maybe possibly if you can duplicate that touch, that tactile cue, a way for them to ask for that person later. Same reason that we all have spoken names or name signs to allow our kids to identify us, to identify the speech teacher from the physical therapist, from the teacher who all might have the, the same skin color and hair length and complexion. Like if, if all of our kids, if all of our providers look very similar to our students who might have limited vision, then how do they tell people apart? Or how do they tell somebody apart when it's really sunny outside and they don't see as clearly as they do in the classroom? Or knowing that you are my teacher at my house and at the mall and in school if I don't necessarily see you clearly. Um, and so this is mine. I don't know if you guys can all see this, but it's literally just a, um, it's a slap bracelet. It's a spiky slap bracelet. You can find these on Amazon. Uh, so it's just to have a really unique texture. It's really different. And if say I was the PT for a student, what I could do is I wear this every time when I introduce myself to my students and let them feel it. But I could have two of these and I could leave one in that child's communication box or object calendar and so that the teacher could put the duplicate in that child's object schedule for when it was time for me to come in for therapy. And so that would give that child an awareness of, oh, right, that lady who wears the spiky bracelet is coming to play with me. Um, and then also be a uh, way in there that if that student wanted to ask, when is the lady with the spiky bracelet coming to play with me? <laughs> they could pull that out of their object calendar and use that as a cue and a way to ask for, for somebody. Um, so it can be a tactile thing. It should be something that is uh, very distinct and different. For some people, it is a, uh, you know, parents sometimes, it's a way that your child touches you. For example, if dad always has a beard, the child might touch dad's beard to kind of recognize and identify him, um, which is great as long as dad never shaves that beard, because then <laughs> that's going to change things a little bit. Um, so it, it can be a, an object, it can be a specific way that the child, that somebody touches the child when they, in, you know, introduce themselves to them, they always come up and squeeze their bicep. That's their way of letting them know. That could be your cue, um, but just something unique that identifies you. And then object cues, which are everyday objects that we use to represent activities throughout the day. So we talked a little bit about touch cues and just they are a way to alert the child something's gonna happen and they happen immediately before that action or activity. So we let the child, you know, we tap the child on their leg uh, to let them know that we're gonna put on their AFOs or right before we put on their glasses, we'll just tap them on the face, maybe giving them a cue by their mouth if we're gonna get ready to brush their teeth, that type of thing. And so, we are running out of time, so I am not going to show you guys, but um, I'm going to send out this PowerPoint. I will share out this PowerPoint to anybody that wants it. And so another thing, this is just Orion again, and mom uses um, some really nice touch cues to let him know that it's time for his medicine and a syringe 
as the object cue to let him know that it's time to take his medicine. Um, so it's a good example of using them together. Why do we use object cues? Help kids develop an expectation of what's coming. Um, developing that independence again, using them to make choices or requests, allows our kids to pre prepare for a transition. Maybe something to, that they do like, maybe something they don't like. Let them know um, when in their day their favorite activity is gonna happen. That type of thing. And so here are some examples of whole objects. For parents, when we're at home now, this should be a, as easy or as complex as you can make it. Um, you know, we use whole objects with our kids as the, as the most foundational, the first place that we start. Um, so that might be using just your child's toothbrush and presenting with them with their toothbrush right before it's time to go brush their teeth as a way to let them know. Might be presenting them with their socks right before we get ready to go move to the changing table to get dressed in the morning their spoon right before it's time to go eat. So it doesn't necessarily have to be creating this abstract system that's overwhelming to parents to, to create and to implement, um, but can be something as simple as using those items in your child's daily routine that they already have and presenting them to them ahead of time as a way to let them know what activity is coming next and where we're going. Are there questions? I saw the chat box moving. I wasn't sure if we're. No questions. Cool. So then if we master those whole objects, um, we can move to some more abstract systems, more expanded systems. And this is probably gonna be more for our students when they're in school, is definitely an area that we should be using this. Um, but it can be at home too, if parents are ready for that. And starting to talk about first then, or building the schedule of our day of what we're gonna do. And you can see this again starts with, can start from at the top with more concrete objects, whole objects that we're using to let a child know what's gonna happen to then moving down to some more abstract symbols. If our child represents, demonstrates to us that they have awareness of an understanding of those abstract symbols. Mm -hmm. When we look at, we can use tangible symbols for our kids that show that understanding of the whole object. For example, if we hand our child their hairbrush and they go to maybe put it towards their head to show that they know what it's for. If every time we show our child their hairbrush and they feel those bristles on the hairbrush, that then we move to just, you know, taking a dollar store hairbrush and taking the bristles out of it and mounting those bristles on a piece of cardboard so that now we're giving them a smaller representation of that hairbrush with that same tactile experience to still represent the activity of going to get the hairbrush and brush our hair. Um, so that's how we move from the very concrete to some more abstract. But as we do that, always be aware of the abstra abstractness, <laughs> how else we say that, of some of our um, symbols that we use. For example, the picture symbol, the board maker symbol here for weight. If that didn't have the word weight on it, I would think that's two people being tied and held for ransom or something back to back. I mean, how do you know what that is? You know, our, our kids might not know the abstract symbol of a clock with two hands on it. Most kids nowadays are not seeing a round clock. They're seeing digital watches or Apple watches or digital clocks. Um, so we have to think about the complexity of the pictures that we use when we're choosing tangible symbols and picture symbols. Um, a photograph is probably your better option of the exact item, the exact object that you were initially using with the child. Found a question? Uh -huh. My child tries to H-O-H me a lot when I'm using H-U-H. She is controlling my movements as if my hands are hers. Should I pull away or put my hands on top of hers? Is this her being expressive? That is hand under hand. So you are, when, you're hand, when your child hand over hands you, when your child H -O -H, does H-O-H to you, you're using hand under hand. Um, and that, so that's perfect. 
do that, reinforce it. And they are, that is, um, uh, lots of kids do that and, and like to use the adult's hands to manipulate things. And I haven't really figured out the research behind why we, they do that, but it, it definitely, it's, it's very common and it's, it's okay because you are then, you're, you're still responding to their communication. They are getting their message out by using your hands uh, they, or they are getting to experience whatever it is, the item, the material, the activity at their comfort level because they're using your hands because maybe I don't want to touch that creepy spaghetti that looks wet and nasty, um, but I'd be cool if you do. So here, let me put your hand in it first and see if you like it and what you think of it. So that is perfectly fine um, and go with that. And then as you repeatedly experience as an activity that you know your child is comfortable with, see if you can then back out and slowly encourage them to more independently explore something or independently use their own body or their own hands to express something to you. But that's, that's great if they will hold your finger and do some, allow, allow you to manipulate something because you are using hand under hand during that. So the hierarchy that we go through of symbols is we start with an identical object. So we give the child their exact object, their shoe. If it's time to put our shoes on and go to the store, we give them their shoe to let them know it's time to put their shoes on. Their hairbrush to brush their hair, their toothbrush before we go brush our teeth. Um, so that they can make that identical connection between the object and its use or the activity that it rep represents. Uh, and then we can move down to a, a partial object or an associated object. So maybe not their exact shoe, but it's a different shoe. So it looks somewhat similar, but it's not exactly identical. Um, or maybe, like I said, it's not the whole hairbrush, but it's just the bristly part that we feel every time we, right before we brush our hair. Or it's half the toothbrush that still has the bristles that provide that tactile experience that's part of what we explore when we discuss what a toothbrush is and we show our toothbrush. Um, so it can be a partial or an associated object. Then we move down to photos, an identical photograph of that object. When we are teaching our kids how to move from 3D objects to 2D representations, we want a photo that's identical to that object that they're using, the picture of their toothbrush, the picture of their shoe, so that they can start to make those connections. Um, then we can move down to a picture symbol if they show that they are understanding that photo. If they can match that photograph of their shoe to the actual shoe, if they're making those associations, then you might be able to move to a picture symbol. Um, and then, of course, we move down to print or braille. And lastly, a spoken word or sign. Spoken words and signs are the last thing on this hierarchy because they disappear. They're most abstract because they disappear. In between the time in the living room of saying it's time to go brush your teeth and getting to the bathroom to brush our teeth, some of our kids might forget. They might not have that um, auditory memory or that visual memory to be able to, to remember from point A to point B, what was I supposed to be doing? How many of us as of adults go from the living room and go, oh, right, I'm going to go do something in the bedroom and get to the bedroom and go, wait a minute, what was I, what did I come in here for again? You know, or in that travel between the living room and the bedroom, you get distracted by something in the kitchen and you're off and you completely forgot what you were headed to in the first place. Um, so having any of those other five things above spoken words and signs is something tactual and concrete that our kids can take with them from point A to point B to remember what they were headed to go to. Something to refer back to, something to repeat that vocabulary to again. Oh, right. Remember, we were going to brush our teeth. You have your toothbrush. There's your toothbrush. We're, go we're taking it to go brush our teeth. So all those opportunities to repeat that vocabulary again and again and again and remember where we're headed. And the iconicity of things, when we choose objects for our kids, when we choose photos or photo symbols, what is your child's experience with banana? If your child's experience is only the cut up banana that they see on their tray when they get ready to eat it, and we decide to give them a photo of a whole banana as their symbol to represent snack time, 
how is that child going to know that that's their banana? We have to teach those associations and make sure that they understand what the symbol is that we are giving them, that it represents something that they are familiar with. And I have like four minutes left. So um, I don't know if we wanna keep going past four o'clock a little bit, or if people wanna stop and ask questions. If we want to hang on or if we will just want to be done. Courtney says, yes, keep going. <laughs> yes, keep going? He says, keep going. All right. Anna, Let's can you keep go. going for a little bit? All right. We've got our interpreter and our captioner that are okay for a little bit that we can. Uh, do you want to put the poll up now for people that do need to sign off? Sure thing. So, yes, I will put up. Um, I don't. Oh. Look at you. Good job. <laughs> I'm like, I don't think I can do that while I'm screen sharing. Um, so for anybody that needs to go, if you could please work on our evaluation. Um, it's just a couple questions on our poll that should be on your screen right now. Uh, that would be really helpful for us for our grant program. Um, and so this is just a quick review because if anybody's interested in, in more information about the communication matrix, a, there is a webinar that I did on the communication matrix for Maryland School for the Blind, and it is on the Maryland School for the Blind's YouTube site. If you subscribe to MSB's YouTube site, you can access the whole webinar. Um, and we're gonna do office hours the first week of June, the first Thursday in June, which if everybody got the June schedule, um, we're gonna do a office hour solely on the communication matrix and just answering questions of how to go through it and answer the questions and then what to do with the results of it if you guys have questions about the communication matrix. But it is the greatest tool. It covers the seven levels of communication, everything from our most basic cries, facial grimaces that our infants give us all the way up to language which makes it a very great tool for any educator or parent. There is a parent-friendly version and a provider version. It is online. That is not the right website on my uh, slide there. That is actually the um, website to, the, to find out the paper copy if you wanna purchase and download the paper copy. The um, virtual copy, there is a copy online can I get to the chat box? Hey, Sherry, uh, if you could type in the chat box, www.communicationmatrix.org is the website to get to the online version for parents or professionals to complete for free. Now, I'm, what? Things happened. Um, so just some examples for you of the seven levels. The first one, pre-intentional, is just a reaction to things, how our infants do, reacting to crying, crying, being wet, being hungry, just basic infantile reactions. Um, intentional behaviors are our parents that in, continue to interpret the child's needs and desires for their behavior. So mom knows what baby's cries mean. This cry is the hungry cry. This cry is the nine to be changed cry. Oh, when they rub their eyes, that means they're sleepy, that type of thing. Parents are still in, interpreting those behaviors, but they are intentional. Um, when you put your child's cup on their tray and they shove it off because they don't want it, they're not necessarily telling you they don't want it directly, but they're just doing something to either get or reject to get their needs met. Um, then if we look at some more the third level, uh, we're using those behaviors intentionally. So now instead of maybe just knocking the cup off the tray, your child throws the cup at you or hands it to you. Type of thing. So we're still using some, some behaviors, um, but we are directing them at somebody to let them know what we need. Um, grabbing mom's hand, pulling somebody you know, to let them know what you want. Um, move down to conventional communication. Those are the socially appropriate gestures. Shaking our head, yes. Shaking our head, no. Pointing, fist bump, those types of things that everyone would understand. 
Then we get down to our concrete symbols, which are the object cues that we were just talking about. Uh, abstract symbols, which might be one word or sign at a time, which is sometimes where our kids get stuck when we get there where they learn, you know, five signs and we're like, oh, look, they've got abstract language. Well, they only got a few, you know, they only have a few words or a few signs. They still might need some of those former foundational um, communication modes to be able to use for expressive as well because we're not fully utilizing abstract language yet. They're still in that building phase. And then formal language, which is combining two or more symbols together. Eat please, more juice, that type of thing. And starting to use grammar. So Jen, we have a question. Mm -hmm. Just to check in on the communication matrix, we introduce language at level one, not level seven, correct? So no, so the purpose of the communication matrix is to assess a child's communication, where their child's expressive communication level is. We expose them to communication at a natural level. We, we don't limit our exposure to natural communication, be that the recept through receptively, be that spoken language, ASL, tactile, whatever is accessible to the child. Um, but we assess their language level starting at that foundational level. Um, and they might be past that. A lot of our kids have already, you can, there is the option to say emerging, mastered, or that no longer applies to my child. They've surpassed that level. Um, so if kids are already using some more concrete forms, they're using some gestures, some intentional behaviors to get people's attention, they might have completely surpassed that first level. And then we start looking at, at, the, at the second and third and down the line. Um, so we can start assessing their love language at that most first level, but we would be providing them with language, complete, full and complete language from the get-go. We don't necessarily scaffold how we present them with language. So how do we get from one point to the other? Um, how do we get from that very, very first level from pre-intentional to, the, to the second level. Um, sometimes we have to over-interpret the message. A lot of times parents will say, eh, that kind of looked like something. I don't know if my child was really telling me they didn't like it or if that was just a, you know, a reaction. Who cares? Let's take it. If we reinforce it as that they actually meant something that they were trying to tell us, then, um, you know, we go with it and hopefully shape that behavior. Uh, but like, for example, anytime a baby cries, you know, if, a, if an infant cries and mom or dad goes to them, that baby starts to learn, oh, if I cry, then somebody's going to meet my needs. So we shape that behavior by reinforcing it. Um, then we move from those intent, those behaviors, intentional behavior to intentional communication. You can do that by involving yourself in the child's play. Uh, getting in there with them so that they're, when they're just getting rid of that cup on that tray, you're there to kind of, to, to catch it and be involved in that activity and then say, oh, is it, you know, model a appropriate way for them. Oh, you don't want juice. You're all done. We don't want any more of that. Um, so involving yourself in their play, in their actions, in their routines, sabotage putting their favorite cookie up on the shelf. So now they can't go get it themselves. They've got to come get you in some way or tell you in some way, hey, I want that thing. So they can't do for their, for, on their own anymore um, and shaping that behavior. Um, and then we can move down by provide, we provide concrete in, items for communication. That's those objects or those photos and making them available to the child. If we develop a communication and object schedule for them, then it's about having those objects available to the child so that they can use to say, hey, I'd like to go play this activity. Hey, I'd like to, you know, I, I need my diaper changed. Uh, and use them as a way to let you know something. And pairing them, we're constantly pairing them. We're still pairing them with language. We pair those concrete objects with words or signs to hopefully then be able to move that child to abstract language uh, by pairing those things together. But we have to have that concrete form. If I just signed something to you over and over and over again, but you had no 
object or concept or anything to to compare it to, you would never be able to, to, to learn and internalize and use that sign because you don't know what it means. So we need to give our children concrete representations for the abstract language that we are modeling to them for them to be able to hopefully make those connections and use them expressively later on. That's just a picture of what the communication matrix looks like. Uh, the grid that you get when you, um, after you answer the questions, this is where they plot the answers onto it too. And so you just see, we talk about pre-linguistic is the behavior, then we get concrete, but they're still give, they're presenting a message to you, but it's in a concrete form. And then we get down into more abstract symbolic language. This, if people signed in on the sign-in sheet and gave their email address, I can send out, this is a really nice poster when it's in bigger format um, from the New York DeafBlind Project. And pretty much they just took the communication matrix and made it into a nice little chart that gives you the level, some examples, some strategies to use, and then a column for you to write notes on about what that child uh, actually does. And weird, where are those lines coming from? Did I draw? I don't think I drew those. Does somebody else have access to drawing on my thing? That's pretty interesting um, how that happened. But so that's just something I can share out with people if they are interested. It's a great example uh, and tool to use for, the, for your team. And we are not going to really go into concept development since we already kind of ran over on time. And those lines don't go away now. So I am going to stop sharing and see if people have additional questions. Sure, Mary, did we be able to get into the, the link to sign in, Mary, or do we, or you can just, I can send it to you, but if you can sign in on the link. If people are having trouble, let us know. Mary, I don't know why that link does not like you. So we can probably stop. Oh, I can stop recording. Look at that. 